So I'm going to get started. My name is Michelle Hoare. I'm the project director for Hey Neighbor. Uh, I'm very, very thankful for the time you've set aside to join us today. I am joining in. Oh, my slides are not advancing. Let's see here. Come on, slides. Hmm. Well, of course, of course, they're not going to do it for me today. What is happening? Just give me a second here, folks. <laughs> Don't know why. There we go. Okay. Who knows? There are gremlins in my computer this morning. So, as I mentioned, for those of you who uh, joined right away, my name is Michelle Hoar. I'm the project director for Hey Neighbor. Uh, and I feel very uh, grateful and privileged to live as a settler on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, which are also uh, in my, the part I live in, in anyway, is known as Vancouver, BC. And we would love to hear <clears throat> where you are joining us from. So please uh, type that into the chat um, because I happen to know you are from all over the place. This is the biggest webinar we've had yet um, at Hey Neighbor. Uh, last time I checked, we were at 445 registrants, uh, everywhere from Prince George to Vancouver to Miramichi, US, UK, Brazil, Uganda, Netherlands, Sweden, Australia. It, we're, it's in, very fascinating to me. Um, clearly a topic that is uh, of a lot of interest, um, and I'm excited to see what kind of uh, chat and conversation happens. Um, and not just from everywhere, but doing all sorts of really interesting things. So, um, you know, the largest group of you decided to remain a mystery, didn't tell us where, where you work, and that's fine. We want to know, but that's okay. Um, but many, many planners, uh, and again, from all over BC, Canada, and beyond. Um, many people in the housing sector, developers, housing operators, property managers. We have researchers, public health professionals consultants, architects, uh, government folks, you name it. So really, really um, nice diversity of participants too. And wanted to just make a special uh, welcome to a few folks that are the winners of this year's Urbanarium competition around decoding density. And I know that there happened to be uh, a focus on social connection in, in, uh, in multi-unit housing for that one. So um, uh, we have lots of people who are just as much um, on the leading edge of this as, uh, as as we like to think that we are. So uh, yeah, well, I know it'll be a rich conversation. So um, <clears throat> to get right into why we are here, being socially connected, uh, you know, having strong social uh, connections is, is so, so, so important. It's not a nice to have. Um, it, uh, it has really, really strong protective um, characteristics for our physical and mental health. Um, uh, and it's, if you are chronically lonely and socially isolated, it is as damaging to your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and it increases the risk of premature death by as much as 50%. So these, this is not a small thing. Um, and it's on the rise, um, and really in every age group and in many, many countries. And so it's, a, you know, it's really one of the key epidemics of our time. Uh, in fact, in the U.S., they are looking at it as a, you know, during during COVID, they were looking at it as a double um, epidemic of, of, you know, public health and loneliness. So really something we need to work on together. And <clears throat> there's it's not new research. This has been happening for a while, but certainly uh, COVID exacerbated it. And uh, the climate crisis we're in is is making it all that much more important that we have strong social connections and particularly with our neighbors. So there's a lot of interesting research from around the world on the particular value of being socially connected with your, you know, your most proximate neighbors. Um, so again, you know, um, uh, really, really powerful, um, positive impacts for people across all age groups, cultures, um, you name it. Um, we've got a really great uh, evidence background or actually that I think Ryan uh, or Noni will be posting in the chat that, that goes through a lot of that research. So a little bit quickly about Hey Neighbor Collective. Um, we are a collective impact project that is housed at the Simon Fraser University's uh, Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue, a really unique 
um, place in a university. It's uh, quite rare for a university to have a space like this. Um, but really, it's all about how we solve uh, today's um, big problems through, um, through using dialogue. Um, so our particular vision is of a future where more of um, Canada's multi-unit housing communities are socially connected, age-friendly, neighborly, health-promoting, and resilient. So Hey Neighbor brings together essentially a whole range of partners, um, housing operators, nonprofits, um, housing associations that represent uh, housing operators like Landlord BC, BC Nonprofit Housing Association, uh, uh, city governments, regional governments, researchers, so Happy Cities I've named here underneath that category, but we also have faculty relationships with gerontology, health sciences and urban studies at SFU, and of course, um, health sector folks like Vancouver Coastal Health. And so what unites all of these partners is a concern around rising um, trends in loneliness and social isolation, um, and looking at how we can <clears throat> mitigate those trends by building community social connection and resilience within multi-unit housing particularly. That's our area of interest. So um, in December, 2020, we worked with uh, some researchers and students to put together a discussion paper for Metro Vancouver, which is our regional government, um, the regional government's uh, updating to the 10 year regional growth strategy. Um, and we called our paper, Developing Truly Complete Communities, Social Equity, Social Connectedness and Multi-Unit Housing in an Age of Public Health and Climate Crises. Um, and this uh, report laid out six different key recommendations around what Metro Vancouver could do as a regional government and what its 21 member municipalities could do in this space. And one of the uh, recommendations that got really, really strong interest was <clears throat> the idea of fostering design, education and dialogue for social connectedness and multi-unit housing. And so we, in partnership with Happy Cities and others, uh, did a series of workshops over the next um, two and a bit years around this idea of mainstreaming, inclusive, age-friendly, sociable, multi-unit housing. So how can we get local governments to, you know, enable and create, to create enabling policy and conditions for this to be, um, you know, the, the typical kind of development, not, uh, not unique unicorn developments. Um, anyway, when, uh, when the strategy passed in February, 2023, uh, there's a little nugget in the housing strategy section that says that all Metro member municipalities will adopt uh, regional context statements that show how their local policies and actions will increase social connectedness in multi-unit housing. So that's a little policy window that we kind of, um, you know, help to help to put in place, um, you know, with, with involvement of many. And <clears throat> that led to finding funding from, uh, for a project that we are in the final phase of. And so what we've done with help from CMHC, Van City Community Housing Foundation, Metro Vancouver, um, BC Healthy Communities, BC NPHA and others as funders is bring together a cohort of six Metro jurisdictions to co-create um, design policy for new housing. And um, we are in the phase right now of putting together a toolkit around that to share with other municipalities across BC, Canada, and beyond even if it uh, if it's useful and relevant. So we hope that that will be done by the end of June. And uh, one of the last at one of the last workshops, as I said, for those of you joining late, we featured uh, Robert Brown, who is a very innovative developer here in Vancouver, uh, but also, uh, as one person put it, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of housing finance. Um, and Robert still swears he hasn't watched Star Wars, so we'll have to fix that. But um, yeah, so our developers, or sorry, our planning participants in these workshops really wanted more education around housing finance, because that's not actually something that most planners get in planning school. And uh, they were really, really appreciative of this. So, uh, so now we get to share it with everybody. So really what we were asking in these four full day workshops with planners, and we were also inviting in uh, housing sector folks, public health, nonprofits, so really a cross sectoral dialogue, is how might we design new age friendly policy approaches to new, new housing that have equity, inclusion, accessibility, cultural diversity, and safety in mind? And how do we make sure that multi-unit housing development isn't even more challenging or more expensive? And how can we look for opportunities to kind of multi-solve as we do the with, with regards to climate mitigation and adaptation? 
um, because we are in a time of poly crisis, uh, and I don't think I need to tell anybody uh, here what that uh, what that looks like and feels like. And so, a time of poly crisis really requires us to to multi solve, to do everything we can with every effort, every dollar, um, to get as many benefits out of our work as possible. Um, and that really requires working across silos. So that's why we feel so strongly about um, pulling together those cross sectoral dialogues around the kind of systemic change we want to see. So last uh, thing I will say is, um, you know, if we really took seriously the idea that housing is essential infrastructure, you know, health, economic, safety and social, how would it shift our policy making and resource flows? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Madeleine Hebert, who is a senior housing specialist with Happy Cities um, and somebody that I feel really, really privileged to partner with on a regular basis. Um, so uh, Madeline, I'll let you share your slides and take over from here. Thank you, Michelle. Um, it's so great to have so many people here and I see some familiar faces, um, which is also nice that you're coming back to hear from me once again. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it brief um, and uh, we'll get to Robert's presentation shortly. Let me share my screen. Looks good, Michelle? Okay. Um, so, yeah, for the past uh, four and a half years, um, I've been with Happy Cities, and um, my background is actually in architecture. Um, and, uh, you know, as I was working in, in the industry, I was really thinking about how buildings actually impact our well-being and our, and our, and our daily lives. Um, and that's not something that many architects get to study. Um, so I've been really privileged um, through my work with Happy Cities and Hay Neighbor Collective to see the housing sector from so many different angles, from you know planners to, to regional governments to federal governments um, and to the people who are actually living in the building. Um, and I can say with very strong conviction that you know the way we design housing really impacts our well-being. Um, so these are a few images from uh, Driftwood Village co-housing. So last year in 2023 we had the privilege of working with the city of North Vancouver to understand the impact of you know what they were building in terms of multi-unit housing on uh, resident well-being um, and specifically we were interested in one of their innovative policies which is the active design guidelines that provides incentives to design buildings that are more socially connected and active um, so one of the communities that we got to know through the process was Driftwood Village co-housing um, so though, you know, you'll see on the picture on the left, it looks like a pretty typical um, mid-rise apartment block um, in our in our region of British Columbia. Um, but when you start to dive into the actual building, it has so many layers of design and programming and operations that are really trying to build community intentionally. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting about this community is that it's very multi-generational. So uh, residents range from newborn babies to an 85 year old um, and they have shared activities and amenities in the building that actually offer opportunities for people to connect. Um, so for many of these residents that we talked to, the relationship that they have formed um, in their building are a lifesaver. So whether it's you know young parents who are trying to juggle childcare, older adults who need help getting groceries or changing a light bulb um, or people living alone who want a bit better sense of community. Um, these, these housing models are really successful. Um, and, you know, we, uh, one of our, my coworker, Emma, wrote a really nice article about Patrice, who is one of the um, older residents at, at Driftwood Village Co-housing. Um, and, you know, you know, she really shared this mutual support that she's getting, and she doesn't have grandkids, um, but she has, you know, a whole bunch of informal grandkids uh, living at the building with her. Um, and they're supporting each other um, in, in really different ways. And it's really beautiful to see, you know, what a positive outcome our housing can actually have on our lives. Um, and, you know, what we're really talking about is like, how do we build these intentional communities? Because a lot of us would like to live in these kinds of places, but we don't necessarily get the opportunity. So, you know, if we count the number of co-housing communities in British Columbia, there's not a lot of them. We're actually the province with the most co-housing communities. Um, if you look at urban co-housing, there's even less of them. Um, so it's really hard to make these projects happen. Um, 
And this intentionality, as I said, can bring a whole bunch of benefits for people of all ages. Um, and, you know, why we're here today, uh, we really want to focus on this affordable, affordability piece. So one of the things, kind of caveats to all of our research is um, when people don't have secure tenure, uh, they don't have housing choices, uh, they can't stay long term in a neighborhood, it's really, really difficult to build those social connections. Um, so that affordability puzzle piece is really key to building kind of the foundation for social connection. Um, and we've been really challenging planners, architects, and developers to think differently about how they design housing. So if we know that there's a crisis of, of loneliness and social isolation, uh, we know that we are building a lot of housing, can we think of our homes as catalysts for social connection um, that can imp positively impact you know, in every aspect of our lives? Um, and you know, we're working in a really complicated and rapidly changing environment, um, as I sure I don't need to tell all the housing planners on this call. Um, you know, there's there's things happening at the federal level, there's things happening at the provincial level, we've got building code changes happening, um, new program launches like BC Build, Rental Protection Fund. Uh, we've got a huge shift um, to, to having more and more people who are lifelong renters. Uh, we've got long approval times for getting housing built, um, escalating construction costs, Shifting demographics, including an aging population, which is going to be really key in, you know, figuring out how we design our cities. Um, and then, you know, just climate change on top of that. So, yeah, this is not a simple task um, to figure out how do we build social connection and trust and belonging within this really complicated context. Um, and then just pulling up this, this slide that looks at kind of like all of the factors that go into ensuring that someone can age in the right place. And we've been thinking about aging in the right place more broadly. So not just older adults, but everyone is aging in place. Um, so how does our housing and our neighborhoods actually respond to our needs? Um, make sure that we can stay in those neighborhoods and build those connections over time. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. The built environment is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, there's also programming, there's policy, there's how we operate our housing. Um, so all of this intersects to create, you know, a space where we can feel at home, where we can build trust, or a space that doesn't support our well-being. Um, and I like to use this slide a lot uh, because it, it really simply il illustrates the kind of spectrum of neighborly interactions that we're talking about. Um, so all of these types of interactions are really good for our well-being. Um, even you know spontaneous interactions, just saying hello to a neighbor on the street, um, having a chat with a barista barista when you get your morning coffee, these are all things that boost our well-being, um, all the way to, you know, number five, where you see mutual support. And that's the kind of thing that I was talking about at Driftwood Village, where people are helping each other when they're sick, they're sharing childcare. Um, and that's where we see communities that are really resilient to pandemics and climate change, um, heat domes. So this is kind of the, the, the range of connections that we're trying to encourage in our buildings. Um, and what we've been finding in our research is that the way we design can uh, encourage these, you know, this range of connections to happen, um, particularly when you're talking about spontaneous interactions. So if you, you know, if you never see your neighbors um, in your building, if you just park your car, go up an elevator, go quickly down a down, double loaded corridor to your unit, um, you're never going inter to interact with your neighbors. You're never going to get the chance to build that mutual support. Um, or even those friendships, or even do any activities with your neighbors. So that's really step one. Um, and that's where we kind of think about the built environment as enabling for those connections. Um, so I'll just go quickly through this. Um, in 2017, we released the Happy Homes Toolkit, which was really the start of our foray into understanding, you know, how housing impacts our well-being. Um, and this framework has been the kind of launch pad for many, many projects that we've worked on. Um, these are some of the reports that we've written in the last year or two, maybe some, a few are, are a bit older, um, but you know, there is a lot of emerging research coming from, from our groups and other groups um, about the importance of this stuff. Um, and you know, a lot of interest from planners and architects and developers on designing, designing housing differently. Um, so these are some of the stats from our 
research with the city of North Vancouver. So we did a survey of multi-unit housing residents. Uh, we heard from over 600 people. Um, and we asked people really specifically, where do you interact with your neighbors in your building? Um, so interestingly, uh, about one in four of those interactions with neighbors were happening in circulation spaces. So lobbies, corridors, uh, near elevators. Um, about one in 10 were happening in outdoor spaces like courtyards or rooftops. Uh, one in five were happening in the zone just outside the building where the kind of the built the public and private realm meet. Um, about one in 10 were happening in kind of parkades, laundry rooms, those kinds of practical spaces. Um, interestingly, the, the numbers for how many people had interactions with their neighbors in indoor amenity spaces, like for example, a, a lounge or a gym, um, were, were quite a bit lower than, than all of these other numbers. Um, so, what that really has gotten us thinking about is these critical zones for social interaction, um, which is how you circulate through the building, um, and this kind of zone where the building actually meets the neighborhood. Um, we also know that, you know, having access to shared space like a courtyard um, is associated with a higher likeliness of knowing your neighbors, uh, better overall social connections, a greater willingness to ask your neighbors for help. Um, and reporting feeling less lonely. Um, and currently, we've been talking a lot with a lot of different jurisdictions on how they regulate amenity space and how they, you know, encourage or don't encourage social interaction in their buildings. Um, so, you know, many municipalities will have uh, requirements to have a certain number of square feet um, of amenity space. Um, sometimes they'll have additional guidelines that aren't necessarily mandatory, or sometimes they're unclear or out or have outdated wording. Um, and what you see is really variable design, design outcomes in terms of social interaction. Um, and it leaves a lot of unanswered questions about, you know, what are these spaces that we're putting in our building? Um, because space is really precious and resources are really precious when we're building housing. Uh, what are the spaces that we're building? Are they actually encouraging social connection? Are they useful for people? Are they, you know, boosting people's well-being? Um, these are questions that are not often answered by our local policy. Um, and, you know, we're, we're thinking about if you think about more of a person-based, outcome-based design rather than, you know, you must meet the certain square footage, um, you know, what are the kind of questions that you might ask if you put yourself in the shoes of a future resident? Um, so yeah, we've been encouraging this kind of outcome-based design thinking. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to go through a few design principles that we've been seeing um, in some of the buildings that we've been auditing that are you know, successfully creating this, this intentional community. Um, so obviously, you know, beyond just the building, the way that our neighborhoods are designed, the way that your unit is laid out um, and the kind of programming you have access to all, all also impact your social interactions. Um, and we also recognize that social interaction happens across all density skills um, from high rise to you know, single detached neighborhoods. Um, we've really been focusing on multi-unit housing forms, so probably like low rise apartments and up. Um, but there, you know, there are solutions that are, are emerging for all, for all kinds of scales of neighborhoods. Um, so these are the kind of six design principles that we've been thinking about when designing spaces for social connection. So the first one is location, uh, interaction, activation, inclusion, transition, and evolution. Um, so location is really about thinking intentionally about where the, the spaces are located in within the building. So if you have you know a set amount of square footage that you're going to put as social space in your building. Where are you going to put it so that it's convenient and visible and prominent and people see it every day and they want to use it every day? Um, and that's where we see the power of something we call co-location. So you'll see in this courtyard building, for example, they have an indoor uh, common space, they have a connection to the lobby, they have outdoor walkways, um, all happening in the same space with, with visible connections. Um, in the other building, we have a kind of a mixed use community with an integrated public space. Um, so you're really capitalizing on that social, those social connections that can happen at the edges of the building. Um, interaction, as I, I said it earlier in our spectrum of social interactions, we really want to maximize the power of those spontaneous daily in encounters with neighbors um, through the way that we design circulation spaces and functional common spaces. 
Um, and that might include creating, you know, comfortable places to pause and interact, making sure that the quality of those spaces makes people feel like, hey, I'm going to spend some time here. I'm not going to rush through. Um, so this, this uh, multi-unit housing building, um, which is kind of senior focused, has a really great seating area um, right at the front of the building. And it's, it's a really great social hub for, for people to stop and um, talk to their neighbors rather than having, you know, an empty lawn, for example. Um, activation. So we really want to create a center or a heart for the community, um, thinking about diverse scales of common spaces, um, and really thinking about, again, that intentionality piece. So what is the person's motivation for leaving their unit um, and actually going to the space? Um, so, for example, this courtyard in this family uh, housing building has a lot going on. There's a community garden, um, there's public art, there's an informal play area. There's direct access to the laundry room, so you can be doing your laundry while your kids play in the courtyard. Um, we've got visual connections from the balconies above, um, and then an indoor-outdoor connection to this indoor space. So there's a lot of reasons why you would want to spend time in this space. Um, finally, inclusion. So we're thinking about, you know, what are the needs of different populations uh, when using this space? Um, and we want to think carefully about accessibility, safety, um, even cultural preferences and identities. Uh, so the seniors building, you'll see, has widened corridors. They've got enhanced accessibility features with handrails. They've introduced natural light to make the corridor a lot more comfortable space, as, as someone might be walking through it slowly. Um, and they've created these nice little seating nooks with artwork, a community notice board, um, so you can go read your newspaper and chat with your neighbor. Um, transition. So this is something that's really important in multi-unit housing. Um, if we don't feel like we have a sense of privacy, uh, an opportunity to retreat, uh, we're, not, we're less likely to want to have those positive interactions. So thinking intentionally about things like, um, you know, active edges with stoops, uh, transition spaces, and then thinking carefully about livability of units. So uh, this particular unit has higher ceilings, and they've got really great acoustics in the building, so you feel like you have this uh, safe haven to retreat, and then when you're when you're out and about, you, you feel more likely to want to connect with your neighbors. Um, and finally, this last concept, uh, evolution, um, is really about allowing residents to develop a sense of belonging through the personalization and stewardship of common spaces. Um, so allowing the spaces to evolve with residents over time. And this is one that's really tricky um, for multi-unit housing. So uh, co-housing does this really well. These are two spaces at, at Driftwood Village Co-housing, the building I talked about earlier. Um, so you'll see this kids' activity room, which is really dedicated to the kids of the building. Um, you know, they can, they can do what they want in there. Um, it's a great, great space to burn off energy. Um, and then the other space that they have is a workshop so a lot of uh, residents downsized from, from single detached homes when moving into this multi-unit housing building. Um, they brought all their tools with them. So they have also a place to you know, do projects, build a birdhouse, whatever you want to do. Um, but these really functional spaces that people can, can actively use are really important. And uh, that's the, the end of my slides. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to Robert now. And Robert, I'm actually just going to interrupt for one second because I realized I stopped one slide short. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly share a slide once. Uh, okay, there we go. I am going to share the agenda slide that I missed because people might be wondering what to do about questions uh, and question period. So, okay, I don't know what, what view you're seeing here, but I don't care. I'm going to be fast. Um, so um, we're going to turn it over to Robert. He's going to have half an hour. And then our first question is going to come from um, Emily Adden, who is the uh, chair of the board for Planning Institute of BC and also an adjunct professor with the UBC School of Community and Regional Planning. Then we will go to audience questions. So please start typing up your questions in uh, the chat box. Noni and Ryan will be looking for overlap and themes uh, and then suggesting questions. We will close at 11, but if people want to stay another 15 minutes to continue the Q&A, um, all of our speakers are willing to do that. So we'll feel that out, but, um, but you can also uh, pop out at 11 if you need to. And with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to Robert. All right.
Uh, well, th uh, thanks, Michelle, and thanks, Madeline. I I just love the uh, love the visuals. It made it makes it always makes it real for me uh, when we see what we really mean by by this social connection. Um, so, um, firstly, thank you for inviting me here today. I anyone who knows me knows I love talking about housing. Um, I especially love talking about housing when it's with a group of people that are are clearly committed to creating what I would call beautiful, healthy, and sustainable housing in, in our communities. And, and clearly by looking at the list uh, of people here today, uh, that includes all of you guys. So thank you for being here. And um, also really thank you for uh, what you're doing in the world. Uh, you're clearly trying to create amazing housing um, and you're trying to make a difference and I, I firstly I just really wanted to acknowledge your commitment to that so thank you for all that you're doing out there and complimenting what we're trying to do here and um, so that's um, yeah that's where I wanted to start um, uh, great to see such a range of, of people here today um, uh, just to quickly cover off, I just give you, I'll give you some background uh, on who I am, so you know who this <laughs> this talking head is. Um, we'll also, I, I was going to just give some quick context to what's happening in the housing market, particularly in in BC. And I know some of you are not from here, but uh, from what I've seen, these the issues that we're dealing with are are literally across the world. Uh, and they're both in cities and they're in smaller communities as well. Um, so after that, I was just going to jump into uh, what we've been talking about, which is the kind of financial levers. Because as Michelle was saying, I, I think often the the in the the planning conversations and design conversations, often um, the financial world and the financial aspects of of a project can be a bit get a bit lost partly because it's quite complicated and it's it can be quite confusing uh so hopefully i'm i'm gonna simplify or attempt to simplify some of those the financial conversations and then as after that as as michelle said we'll, we'll throw open for questions which to be really frank, that's always the the most important part and the most interesting part. So I'll I'll try to get to that as quickly as we can. Um, so as I say, just briefly, who I am. I've, I've been involved in real estate for forty five years. Uh, started in the kind of commercial leasing and sales area in in Scotland. Uh, moved to Vancouver in nineteen eighty eight, um, and then started doing, we did the same here and then also started doing my own development work through my company, Chesterman Properties. Uh, I've done a variety of kind of multi-home uh, buildings. I've uh, been involved in in resort and campground properties on Vancouver Island. Um, and then in uh, 20, uh, also was got quite heavily involved in green building through a company called Resource uh where we worked with a lot of developers and, and municipalities to try to um, make progress in the whole area of green building. Um, and then in 2013, I, I started a, a nonprofit development entity called Catalyst Community Development Society. You see some of the, the projects that we worked on. Um, we developed, owned and operated, or still operate, um, uh, a large number of below market rental housing. Um, and um, just as an example, this project that you might down in the bottom row in the middle is a, uh, a project called Madrona at Dockside Green in Victoria. And Michelle and, and Catalyst, and, uh, led by Maura Chestnut, um, really started looking at, at that project as a, as a pilot project for social connection. And, and that spun out off into what Catalyst called the Community Connections Program that we tried to implement into all of our buildings, uh, both from a design perspective, but also, as Madeline was saying, from a programming perspective. And... It it you know it's not easy it's not perfect but uh, we were we give it our best shot so 
Um, so I stepped away from Catalyst about three years ago. Um, and uh, since then, I've been involved, currently involved with a, uh, as an advisor to an impact investor. So this is a, an investor who wants to invest their money into affordable housing and regenerative organic agriculture. So two quite different areas, but connected through the desire to, to make a, a, a healthier world for all of us to live in. Um, and then I'm also uh, currently on the uh, board commissioner with BC Housing. And so this is where I always have to give the caveat that I am in no way today talking on behalf of or, or for BC Housing. Uh, but it does. It's been a fascinating journey for me over the last six months. Work, you know, on the board of getting a, a a deeper understanding of of the issues that we're dealing with in our community. So it's it's been it's been great work. Um, so moving on, um, really just as as some context, like really, I think what I I've, I've heard from what Hey Neighbour and Happy Cities are trying to do and many of you, and, and that is creating housing that builds community and connection. Um, there, the, so the other questions that come out of that are, if there are increased costs in doing this, how do those costs get paid? Um, and then at the same time, as Madeline uh, quite rightly said, you know, we can create buildings that are socially connected, but if people can't afford to stay in them, or they or they don't have security of housing, that's a that's a major issue. Um, so we we need to look at the what are the current financial realities of creating market and non market housing, and then what are the levers that we can can pull in order to make that housing more affordable to people based on their income, um, which kind of segues into my my take on you know i often get asked why do we have a housing crisis uh i try and boil it down i i i highlight these three numbers on the left bottom left of this slide now these numbers are slightly outdated uh if anything they probably got worse uh but these are numbers based on on the greater vancouver market so in those 16 years to 2017 uh, condo ownership condo prices rose 365 percent rents went up 75 percent and incomes went up 18 percent so so right there you see the fundamental issue that we have now is that um, home prices and even rents have become disconnected completely from what people are earning and that's the core issue that we're we're dealing with from an affordability perspective. We've seen a huge increase in house prices uh, that was worsened in the pandemic, um, especially in smaller communities where people were relocating from larger urban areas, selling homes, and and quite adversely impacting the home ownership market in smaller communities because they could work uh, remotely, um, and um, the other part of the equation is that many local residents are being priced out of, of moving into the ownership market, um, stayed as renters. So the number of renters increased. And that was exacerbated by a, a lot of new residents moving in. And many of those re residents are, are in, at least initially, are renters. So we're adding more demand on, on the rental housing that we have. Um, we also saw and still see a limited new supply of rental housing. And so with all of that put together, you've got a huge increase in the, the demand for rental housing, which pushes prices up. And on top of that, I, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but in BC, we have protection for renters if they, if they stay in their existing homes um, the the amount of rent increase is limited by legislation. So, but but in a time where the market rents are increasing dramatically, you see very few people moving because they they need to stay where they are to to benefit from those lower rents. Um, and then the last piece, just to make matters worse, we've seen a, a saw for many years a loss of existing affordable market rental housing so these are older buildings 
and there was a lot of pressure on them to um, they were being bought by developers and they were being renovated and rents were increasing dramatically. Um, as, as Madeline mentioned, though, we have a little bit of light at the, the tunnel in that area with the Rental Protection Fund in BC, which is a, 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 a basically a large uh, contribution, funding contribution was made by the provincial government for $500 million to help nonprofits buy market rental buildings and retain them at the affordable uh, rental level that, that currently existed. And we've seen a great uptake of that program and it's really making a difference. So, so that's the kind of what I would say is the market rental or the rental market context that we're, we're currently working in. Um, and as if that wasn't kind of hard enough, um, we're also seeing, we've seen in the last two to three years, a significant increase in interest rates and then the cost of building new housing. Um, so, and this is where we get into kind of the dynamics of, of the market and things like, you know, land prices. Um, the, one of the issues that we're currently deal, dealing with is that developers have purchased land at, at prices that were based on significantly lower interest rates and significantly lower costs. So they basically paid for this land based on those assumptions. Those assumptions have now changed. So they basically have overpriced land. So they're they're struggling to make any kind of rental projects work. And I'm, I'm sure the municipal planners on on in the room today uh, are hearing that from developers. And uh I, it it's not it's not untrue. It it is a major issue. And what we're seeing also is that as developers are saying, well, we can't afford to pay as much for land now, uh, but you're seeing a resistance from landowners, especially those that don't have to sell. So we're kind of stuck in a little bit of what I would call inertia. Um, and um, th that's why we're part of the reason why we're seeing fewer new rental buildings being built. Um, so the last couple of points just to make on context. Uh, where was there somebody trying to talk? Okay. Um, is that whereas density can be our friend sometimes in, in helping reduce the overall cost of land, it's not the be all and end all. It's not a magic bullet solution. And, and often that has been the case. We say, well, we'll just add density and that will solve the affordability issue. It, it, it doesn't always work that way for a number of reasons, but we'll, we can talk some more about that. Um, so the um, that's really what I wanted to say on the, the context side of the equation. Um, the, what we're, we're um, there is some uh, interesting dynamics happening in the in the rental markets and in this market anyway and that is that there's there's a lot of um, there's many of the suggested approaches that that Madeline walked through are are already being adopted in the housing that is being built um, partly because of the good work being done by the municipalities and and um, asking and and uh, incenting developers to to create that those those design inclusions and it's also being driven by what people want uh in the housing the people that are going to live in the housing so it's we're we are seeing a lot of rental projects uh becoming quite amenity rich so we're seeing better amenity spaces we're seeing dog washes we're seeing better bike parking we're Seeing a lot of these, you know, we're seeing urban rooftop agriculture. Uh, all of this is is because people are are asking for this, and and the developers are realizing that they that they need they need to demand or they need to provide these amenities in order to be competitive. Um, but there are these larger financial challenges that exist um, that I that I wanted to talk about. So. I'll just um, switch gears here to um, 
another uh, another slide here. Uh, and so for those of you who are not familiar with with project financials, please don't be freaked out by the fact that I'm about to present an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so this is a this is a, a very simple model that that we've created. And what I'm I'm trying to do with this, um, and the first thing I would say is that it's far from perfect. This is is really more to be illustrative as opposed to um to be a perfect financial model, but um, it is based on a real project that we've been involved with, which is a a, a, a rent a market or a rental project that is um, that is a, a hundred homes um, based in the lower mainland of BC. And what we're trying to do here, if you can see on the on the left hand side, we've got all of the or the major components that make up the cost of a building. And I've got two columns. One is market and one is non-market. So we're going to play with the column on the right that that if we can adjust some of those costs, what impact does that have on the rents that we need to charge to make this a viable project? Um, so we'll we'll just we'll we'll kind of jump into this and 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 then hopefully this will spur a lot of questions. Um but we're we're going to look at at the cost side, and then we're going to look at the financing side. So really, what we're any project that's trying to deliver more affordable rents is trying to do is firstly, what can we do to reduce costs, and then what can we do to finance those the costs that we do incur in a more efficient way, in a more financially viable way. Because the lower the cost of financing that cost, uh, the lower the rents we need to charge. So that that's looking at it from a, a non-market perspective. Uh, the market will continue to charge whatever the market will bear from a rental perspective. Uh, so if they can decrease their cost and improve their financing, that would improve the return to them for the for on the on the market project. So we'll just we'll jump in. We're going to look at these costs. So uh, often in the mark in the non-market projects, so the non-profit projects so that I've been involved with, one of the key areas because it's a, a very significant cost is land. Now uh, we have I have done projects with uh, where municipalities have contributed that land at, at a basically a, a nominal cost of a low cost. Um, we also have done projects with with nonprofits and churches who already own land. Um, now sometimes that land contribution is conditional upon a new church being built or a new program space being built. So that cost has to be considered as a, as a land cost, but we can see um, we can see the impact of that. So if I if we are fortunate enough and, and over on the right here, you'll see these project costs, but then it, it correlates directly to what the average rent per month is over here. And right now both market and non-market are sitting at $3,500 per month average, which down below that you'll see is six, just over $6 a square foot. So as context, this is not a viable project right now. And, and this is one of the issues, again, as you'll see later, is the cost of financing makes these, is a, a major factor in why these projects are not viable. So, but just going through some examples of what can happen. So if we do get municipal land, I'll just basically take that land cost to zero. And you'll see that over here on the right under the non-market. So we're seeing that that has decreased that project cost. If everything else stays the same is reduced the cost by 11%, right? So that's a, an example, a pretty major example of what can happen. Now, on the, the next one down is what we would call hard construction costs. So that's the actual cost of building the physical building, not including 
the other uh, kind of fees and, and design costs. So there's actually, our experience has been there, there's not a huge amount of leverage that we can put on those costs. Now, we obviously can focus on uh, how to design the building more efficiently. Um, some of the things that municipalities are asked and planners are asked to do is, is can we build smaller homes? Can we build narrower homes so we can fit more homes within a building? Those to me, if, if the design is done properly, can be quite advantageous to getting these um, buildings built more efficiently and more cost effectively. But for now, we're for the sake of this exercise, we're just going to leave this um, this number where it is. Um, municipal fees is the next category, and I've split out. And again, in Vancouver, we've got municipal fees. We've got, and then we have Metro Vancouver and TransLink fees. Um, that's been a quite a contentious issue recently, as some of you know, but. Um, so, but just to, to play around with that, and uh, we have, when we've done non-market projects and, and other, uh, in some cases, market rental projects have, have achieved a reduction in these, these municipal fees because the municipality is trying to incent the, the building of market and non-market rental housing. And, but there are still some municipal costs that are charged in these. So I, I, I'm going to just, Take that down to a, a more realistic number. If if a in this case, I'm assuming two thirds of those fees are are waived or exempted from the municipality, so that makes an additional impact of about one and a half percent on the on the cost side. Um, now for affordable um, uh, housing projects in, in the lower mainland, both the Metro van DCCs and development cost charges and the TransLink charges are, are exempted. So if we zero those out, again, you see um, now we're getting down to around 15% uh, improvement of rents. Now, uh, below this average rent number, you'll see the numbers that are that are being achieved on the different home types, so studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. Some of those larger homes are still really not quite affordable, um, but you'll 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 you, you get the idea that we're moving closer to where we need to be. Um, the consultant uh, costs um, again. Um, there's there's these are really market costs that are not. Um, are quite difficult to impact. So what we really try to focus on in trying to deliver a more efficient project is, is consultants who really get efficiency. They get the idea of working with a budget. They are super creative at building and design or designing and building buildings that are efficient from both a cost perspective, construction cost perspective, but also from an operating cost perspective. So for now, we're just going to leave those costs where they are. Um, excuse me. So on the um, construction uh, financing, and I've broken the financing piece into two. One is the this is the cost, the interest that we pay while we're building the building. So this is the construction loan cost. And right now, just as a frame of reference, we're looking at, if a market developer is paying market construction costs, they're paying around eight and a half to nine percent interest, which is quite a staggering number. That number two and a half years ago was about three and a half or four percent. So we've seen a, a more than a doubling of interest cost. So if we can get back through creative financing and support from from lenders to a to a a more realistic number. Uh, I'm going to pull this down to uh, roughly half of that. So again, we're all of these items are you're now at a quite a significant reduction in cost. GST, uh, as we all know for rental projects, is now exempt uh, with a certain timeline. So we're going to zero that out. 
And now we're down at about 17.5% below, below the cost. Um, the, the last item on the cost side is, is profit or return on equity. Now, when any developer, whether it's a non-market developer or a market developer, they, they do need to be compensated for risk, right? And um, the way a market developer would typically look at a project is how much uh, is, first of all, is a return on the cost. So you have this total cost number, which is in this case right now sitting at about $50 million before you take out the profit. And I've used a number of 12% of the cost as the profit. More importantly, or as importantly, the developer also looks at how much actual cash do I need to invest in this project? So the, the more they can borrow against the project, the less cash. It's like, any, it's like us buying a house. If we can buy a house, you have your mortgage and then whatever's left over is your down payment. It's the same in a market development situation. So often they're, they're, they're as interested in, in, what is the amount of cash that I have to invest and what's the return I get on that cash? So, uh, but on the non-market side, um, really uh, the, the non-profit developer is saying, I just need to look at how much, if I need to, to invest cash or equity into this project, what is the cost of that money for me? Now, if I have that money myself, if I can do a capital campaign or I can raise it in other ways, um, that the cost of that is basically zero. But sometimes, and this is where groups like Impact Investment comes in or groups like Van City Foundation have invest money into projects and they need a, they need a return on that. So when I looked at this, you know, there is a cost to this equity for a project, even in a non-market scenario, but you could probably, we can probably bring that down to around a million dollars. That's the real cost of, of any equity that we need to provide. So now we're down to, as you can see on the right here, 23% of a reduction on a market, uh, on a market rental project. We're now down at, at studio rents of around $1,500 a month, which is, you know, a little bit lower than the market in, in greater Vancouver, unfortunately. Uh, the higher higher rents are, are still a bit challenged, uh, or the larger homes are still a bit challenged from a rent point of view. So now we get into the financing piece and to try to keep this simple, um, at the end, typically in a construction project, you have your construction loan and then you have your long, what I call your long term and it's sometimes called a takeout loan. So these are, this is your five to 10 year loan that you, you take out um, on completion of construction. That is the mortgage that you're paying off both principal and interest on just like a home mortgage over the, while the project is, is working and operating. So the three components of that financing, again, I'll try to keep it simple, but are the three, uh, three pieces. One is the interest rate. One is the, what we call the amortization, which is the number of years that the loan is paid off over. And then we have what's called a DSR, or it's got a debt service ratio. So this is the, is really the buffer in the project. So a lender, if you're earning, say, a million dollars of income on a building, they don't want their mortgage payment to be a million dollars because then there's no buffer, right? So they they build a buffer. Any lender will build a buffer into a project. At, at 1.2 debt service ratio, that means there's a 20% buffer on that project. Now, for below market rental housing projects, uh, some lenders will reduce that that number so if you reduce that number it means you can you can you have more money available to pay a mortgage therefore you can borrow more money therefore you need less cash invested in the project if that makes sense so i'm just going to 
to to play with these numbers and you'll see the impact that it has. Now, if I can reduce the four and a half percent number to three and a half percent, it doesn't sound like very much, right? It's 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 only one percent. But if I change that, notice we've gone from 23% below market to 30%. So it makes a dramatic difference in the in the in the rent that we can we can reduce our rents to. The other, the second piece is, or I'll go to the debt service ratio. If a lender like a CMHC or other lenders who are, you know, backed by the federal government, will will reduce that to that debt service ratio, that buffer I was talking about. And again, there, if we change that to just one point one, which again doesn't sound like very much, but it makes another five percent difference on our rents. And then the another big component of the financing piece is is amortization. So if I can spread the mortgage off over a longer period of time, my mortgage payment comes down, right? Some of you may have seen that in your in your home mortgages if you have one. Um, and right now, um, again, CMHC as an example, uh, backed by the federal government, are now allowing amortizations up to 50 years for non-profit, non-market projects. And so we're currently sitting at 34%. Now we go up to 44%. So now this is kind of the blue sky world. This is where everything works perfectly. We get we get a land contribution. We get support from municipalities. We get better financing. We have no GST. We can reduce our cash requirement or return expectations. And then we do a, a significantly improved long-term mortgage. Again, this is just an illustration, but you're getting down to about 45% below a full-blown market project. And now you're down at, at these rents that are, are, are fairly well below market um, in, in a project like this. So I know that's a lot of, lot of numbers, a lot of talking. And so I'll just, I'll, I'll stop sharing this for now and we'll open it up for questions. Robert, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll make sure that we share this video, of course, with uh, with everybody that's here and and with others, so that you can watch that a few more times again if you need to. You know, take it to your yeah. your colleagues in your city, to your elected officials, to your MPs and MLAs. Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll make sure that that's available after this. Um, so I'm going to turn the first question for the Q&A period over to Emily Adden, um, but also just remind folks to pop your questions into the chat. Um, if we don't get to all of them today, what we like to do with these things is uh, have a blog post afterwards that has the video um, and uh, any extra questions that weren't answered, we'll get um, Madeline or Robert to answer those for you in the blog post. Um, but uh, Emily, what, uh, why don't you launch us off with our with the first question? Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I'm really pleased that you brought me in uh, to ask the first question. And as I think Robert knows, I'm a longtime fan of his and, and really appreciated the presentations from him and from Madeline. Uh, it was, it's been a really great session this morning. So I do have many questions, but I won't be greedy. I've been invited to ask the first question. So uh, the question I'm gonna ask um, in a sense brings some of the learning and discussion from both of the presentations together. Uh, we heard from Robert that building more efficiently and cost effectively would help bring down the hard construction costs, um, which, but that could be seen to be at odds with some of what we also heard uh, this morning. Uh, I guess it's not the morning for everyone that's joined us, but uh, at odds with some of what we've learned about uh, designs uh, of increasing chances of intentional community. So my question is, what are the opportunities uh, to optimize efficient design without losing that goal of building 
intentional community? And also, do you ever see situations where the hard or soft costs exceed for non-market uh, exceed the average of what you would see for private projects? Because I do see sometimes there's a struggle there uh, or um, a trade, a potential trade-off between both of those sets of goals. So, so that's to Madeline and Robert, I suppose, and maybe Robert could start us off. Sure. Uh, I mean, that's a great question because this really is the, the nub of the issue. Like how do we um, make buildings that are help us be more connected without impacting the affordability of them? And it really is a, it's a balancing act um, whereby I think if we can find efficiencies in in buildings, um, then we actually, yes, some of that saving can go towards affordability, but also some can go towards more, uh, more amenity riches in the building. And, you know, i am just use an example. Like, so, you know, if you can, if you can, come up with a good strong design that still manages to to create livable homes that but you can maybe they're narrower maybe they're smaller maybe you can but at the same time if I'm building smaller homes I, there's benefits to having a better amenity space within the building or a better courtyard and so that's really where you you're tar you are trying to get the balance between the two and we when we uh, as an example, Catalyst's first project was in was in Victoria. I mentioned the Madrona building, which is where we piloted this uh, community connections program. And this met a lot of resistance. But when we took on the project, it was originally designed as a townhouse project for sale project. So we or that was the concepts that had been designed for the site. We took it on and we said, well, we would rather provide homes for people than homes for cars. So we reduced the, the parking, which was all along. It was a slope site. All the, the garages were along the, the ground floor or the lowest level. And there was one for each of these townhouses. We took all of those garages, minus about six of them. And so we provided six parking stalls for 49 homes, right? rather than parking for every home in the project. We then used that space and designed it and we created uh, 29 studio homes. Now those studio homes were between 250 and 300 square feet and people were going, what? Like, I mean, some of the planners were resistant, people, members of the public were going, and all I can tell you is that we have so you have these small studio homes completely self-contained their own front door their own little stoop out front uh their own washer and dryer like high quality livable homes in under 300 square feet and we charge we the market is for those homes now is about probably somewhere in the range of eighteen hundred dollars where the catalyst is charging around seven fifty a month for those homes right now. So there you have an example of a of a build you thinking creatively about the design and efficiency of a building while maintaining livability and amenity and delivering affordability. So it's a it's a tricky puzzle, but it's it's possible if we have everybody kind of on the same page. Yeah, and I'll maybe I'll add to that point about having everyone on the same page. I think, you know, a lot of the communities we talk about and work with, um, they're they're they experience you know delays. So, getting housing approved has taken a long time um, historically, um, and we know that like every month of delay costs a significant amount to the project team. So if we can you know be on the same page about what is good amenity space. Um, what are the qualities that we want in our buildings? Um, then suddenly we, we've got a big advantage because we can get those those buildings approved faster. 
um, that's going to result in some savings to the project. Um, and and I think it's also recognizing that you know these features that promote social connection don't necessarily have to cost a lot of money. You know, we're not talking about a swimming pool and a bowling alley and you know 8,000 square feet of amenity space. That that doesn't guarantee community. Um, but what you see in the the buildings, like you know what Robert is talking about, is like these really well designed and well thought out features. So you might have you know a social housing building that has a limited amount of interior amenity space, but maybe you decide to do a, a laundry room that's right next to your lobby and connects to the courtyard, and that suddenly becomes, you know, dual purpose. So you're you're saving money um, on having this kind of shared laundry space, but it also becomes a really high quality social connection space uh, where, you know, you're doing your laundry and your kids are playing in the courtyard. Um, so, you know, we can think really practically, and same with like, for example, parking reductions. So um, another one of the urban co-housing communities that we've we've talked to is Little Mountain in Vancouver. Um, they were able to get parking space reductions from the city of Vancouver. Um, and, you know, instead of instead of putting parking in their in their underground, they they have a music room and a and a woodworking shop. So they were able to really like it wasn't a huge cost to put those rooms in, but what they needed was that that parking reduction to actually make it happen. And I'll, I'll maybe just add to the this question of, of timing and I, I know that any planner on this call has been taking a lot of I would even say abuse over the last few years about permitting times and I, I, I just first of all want to acknowledge how hard the job is that you guys do um, and we have I've also experienced uh, to Madeline's point where if everyone is on the same page things can move very quickly and very effectively. When we worked on a project at Catalyst with a, a church at um, the Oak Ridge Lutheran Church at 41st and Canby, we had a, a combined rezoning and development permit application in for that project. And we got from application date to public hearing third reading in seven months. And so that that's that's what's possible if but everyone has to be on the same page and everything everyone has to be looking for we, how can we expedite this project process so um and then i totally agree with madeline parking is is a massive issue i'm i'm really excited to see that projects some projects now i've seen it in the city of north vancouver where they're approving rental projects well located close to transit being be having no parking as i mentioned the project in in that we did in in victoria madrona was 49 homes and we had six parking stalls now it was a five minute walk from downtown victoria it had co-op cars it had bike rooms we even gave residents a bike uh, so it's transit passes like there's ways to do it, but it and it has a massive impact. Well, as I say, we we converted what was going to be parking garages into homes. That to me makes sense. Yeah, and, um, and obviously you need the right context to do that. Um, so you need to have you know the car share is available, the bike share is available, the um, willing municipality, the the transit infrastructure. Um, but you know, I think. It's, it's kind of like always a challenge to balance, you know, what what is in the neighborhood and, and the kind of like future housing that you're you're hoping to create. That's great. I'm going to move us to um, to a first question from participants, although I know you guys could chew on uh, on that uh, on Emily's great question for a while yet. Um, I am going to ask people to to put their questions in the chat as opposed to raising your hand, just because we have so many participants, it'll be hard to manage that way. Um, uh, I did want to um, both both Madeline and Robert were just talking about uh, you know uh, planners getting kind of abused for bad process and and how it can go very well but often doesn't and there was a great great question in the chat about um, something around the real problem we have of villainizing each other in the in the whole process and and scheme of housing right renters. Um, uh, 
kind of really not liking landlords, everybody blaming developers, people not liking the planners and the planning process, and it becomes a quagmire. And how do we how do we get around that? And um, I just really want to say that we we really need to be working together. We can't just be meeting at the point where we have a development that we want to pursue. Um, we have to be meeting way, way, way before that. And I think that our workshops that we did, you know, over the fall and uh, and early winter were really about that. It was really about that sustained cross-sectoral dialogue so that people on different sides of the equation can learn from each other and actually work towards policy and practices that that work for everybody, right? Get everybody's needs met um, and, and kind of end that, like the finger pointing, the incessant finger pointing we do on housing. Um, Ryan, do you want to launch us uh, into our, I guess we're answering the second question, because I just answered that first question around the quagmire of finger pointing. Yes. Um, so let's uh, let's go to you, Ryan, for the first question from, Perfect. from participants. Thank you. We have um, a very amazing chat going, um, lots of great questions that we will, hopefully if we have time, we can go a little bit past 11. Um, but one question that came up, um, it's a little bit um, taking a, a bit of a turn. Um, someone asked in the chat, are there any municipalities that are considering modular housing as an opportunity to reduce construction costs? Um, and I think uh, I'll float it to the group at large, um, Robert or Madeline, if you want to take a, take a crack at that, or Michelle. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I, 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 I would suggest that all, if not most, municipalities would be open to and would encourage modular construction. Um, I, I don't want to pour cold water on the idea uh, because, you know, I think there is a place for modular housing. Uh, I, where I've seen it successful is really in two areas. One is in, in what would is sometimes called rapid response housing. Uh, City of Vancouver did their temporary modular housing uh, projects, uh, built 600 homes very quickly, about, I think it started about five years ago, six years ago. Um, and, and then CMHC followed that up with funding for rapid response housing, which was really modular housing built very quickly. And, and it was, it, in my opinion, it was a huge success. Right. One of the reasons it was a success, though, was because particularly ones in Vancouver, it was that it was supported um, by uh, support. It was it was supported 24 seven supports, with, but with yeah. for people in the housing. And that was a critical component of it. Um, the other place I've seen modular housing be successful or relatively successful is in remote markets. Right. So if you're trying to do a housing project in a in a very rural community where their construction trades are limited, really can you know, you can't deliver that scale of housing project in that market with local trades, modular housing can be a good solution. Having said that, the I have not I've been involved in a couple of modular housing projects directly. I've seen lots of others. I've we tried to, we looked at, at modular housing with, when I was at Catalyst, we got it costed and the cost of modular housing compared to conventional stick frame housing, for, I'm talking for larger multi-unit projects was just simply not competitive. So I'm not saying it's not never gonna work. I'm just saying that the industry has to find a way to be more efficient, but I think it's actually more about what's the application like trying to build a a six story modular building with very you know studios one bedrooms two bedroom three bedroom homes but in modular construction i think there's a it's a, there's a big gap there of mm -hmm. of because i don't think it's the right application whereas the 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 rapid response housing as an example was well suited because it was all studio homes it needed to be built quickly so it, it's a, as much about the application than it is about the actual technology or form of construction. Yeah. And then I think there's there's a lot of interest from the BC government and the, the federal government in kind of prefabricated uh, components for housing, right? Uh, so more kind of standardized, you know, built-in factories pieces. So not fully modular like we're talking about with temporary. 
uh, housing, but um, more of a prefabricated industry to speed up time and, and reduce labor in, in a yeah. constrained labor market. Um, but also just, in just standardized that, designs. Would, yeah. Yeah. Just on that. Sorry, I was, would say that the, the vast majority of, of conventional, what I would call stick frame or wood frame projects are using panelized framing yeah. right now. Like it's, ha it's already happening. So, yeah. Yeah. and it's going to be, it, you're bang on it. It's got to become more, even more prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Ryan, let's go to a next question. Uh, we have 10 minutes until the 11 o'clock official close. But like I said, we're happy to stay on for at least another 15 minutes to keep going. Cause I know we're only starting to get to questions. So um, Ryan, what's popping up next? Um, there's a question here I think is interesting. Um, someone asked, given the title of this webinar, how can we best communicate a simple definition of what goes into affordability, in quotes, in housing that can dispel some of the multiple, sometimes negative interpretations? How do we untangle the story of the puzzle for everyday people to understand? Mm, a juicy one. This is, a me this is a meta question around affordability <laughs> and affordable housing. I don't know. Who wants to tackle that? Madeline? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, I think it's, I mean, I think first step is like, just, I think there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings around affordability. Um, and, you know, even like, if you look at standard definitions of for affordability, um, CMHG has one, but everyone is using different terms in different ways. Um, and it is like kind of the core problem um, that is challenging housing right now um, is affordability. So in terms of like making it accessible, um, I think it's like bringing the conversation, that piece into the conversation around housing. So, you know, Michelle and I have been talking about social connection, for example, um, but we can't ignore that affordability piece as we're talking about it. Um, so understanding like what are the, the impacts in a simple way. Um, and, you know, this is what we've been trying to do with Robert is like a lot of people don't understand housing finance, for example, um, because, you know, it's not part of their education um, or, you know, for example, their only interaction is on specific projects where a developer is giving you, you know, numbers if you're a municipal, municipal planner. And you don't necessarily have the tools to to assess like how how am I going to impact this? Um, and and a lot of municipalities, you know, have different levers. So they might have you know incentives, for example, bonus density, um, different reductions in, in in fees, and not a full understanding of like what the impact down the line on the project has. Um, so I don't know if that really answers. Maybe I'll, I'll pass it over I, to Robert. Yeah, I also think we've there that we're at the point now um, in so many communities in Canada, and I know in other countries too, that that such a vast majority of us are now feeling like we don't have access to affordable housing. That it there's no way for it to um, to do anything but but change in terms of people's perspective. Like we most of us need better options and choices for for affordable housing right now it's it's no longer and it hasn't been for quite a long time you know just a small slice of the population that is that is suffering we've got a you know a, a mass scale problem in our hands um so you know affordable housing like stuff that's like technically called affordable yes yeah, still does face stigma in communities and that's that's a whole other five part session i think so um uh, at the at the risk of uh, not answering that question fully, I feel like we should move on to uh, one more before we close and give everybody a link to the evaluation form and then keep going for those who can stay. So Ryan, feed us another one. Nice. Thank you so much. And I see in the chat, um, Sue Lance had said um, maybe using different terms in terms of attainable versus yeah. affordable and things like that, which I think is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, we had a question. Um, for Robert, um, and also probably, I'm sure Michelle and Madeline also have opinions or thoughts, um, but the question was, in your opinion, what would be the highest impact policy reform to reduce costs for affordability that you've outlined? <laughs> Great question. Um, and, and not 
swerving the question, but the, the, the it it's a compilation of things, right? Like that's where we need to go. I mean, I know that we all would love a silver bullet that would just happen and poof, affordability is solved. Um, so there is a combination of things. And if I was to pick one, uh, as you saw, hopefully from from the the process I went through there with the numbers, the financing side of the equation is absolutely massive. Like it it it's the one that has the biggest lever, and and you know, right now if I'm building a a below market rental housing project, um, that that um, the interest rates are probably somewhere like three and a half to four percent somewhere in there like would be if I funded it today uh three years ago that same project would cost me somewhere in the range of 1.2 to 1.5 percent financing and that, that CMHC financing with longer amortization um low debt service ratio so in 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 terms of a you know say a the kind of project that I was I was showing like a hundred home uh, project that is that's in probably in the range of like ten million dollars of equity like it's the difference right so it, as far as levers which lever can I pull and which is going to have the most impact it's 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 long term financing costs. Like what can I borrow against on this building based on rents? Because if I can decrease the cost of my mortgage, I can charge lower rents, right? So now, again, the federal government has done, a, I would say, a, a very good job over the last few years of bringing in programs that are, that are delivering low-cost financing. The challenge is that to do it at scale, they need to basically borrow that money from the capital markets and it's based on what's the bond market right now again not to get technical but is there a is there an ability for the federal government to actually say we will we will subsidize that interest rate so even if i were borrowing the money from the bond market is there a way to you know us to subsidize that interest rate and then I, I think that's the that's how to have significant impact, right? And I think this goes back to my comment about how we need to see housing as essential infrastructure, right? Yeah. Health, economic, yeah. safety, you know, um, you know, we need to take a different mentality to to that that really critical finance piece. Um, okay, so Ryan just popped a link uh, to our evaluation survey into the chat for those of you who need to leave right at eleven. Um, and please, we would so appreciate you taking like three, maximum five minutes to fill that out. Um, so one of the one of the questions we'll ask in there is actually about um, projects that you know of, live of, worked on that are, um, you know, affordable or attainable, that are socially connected, because um, we'd love to hear about uh, great examples out there in Canada and beyond. And we will pop some of those examples into the follow up blog post we do. Um, so as people, some people leave and some people stay on, Ryan, why don't you uh, give us another question? And thank you again for everybody for taking time with us. And, and thank you again to our sponsors as well for making this possible. So thank you to CMHC, to Van City, to Metro Vancouver, and to BC Nonprofit Housing Association. Amazing. Thank you. Um, all right. So another question we have here. Um, for buildings, I think this is maybe uh, general. There wasn't a person specifically assigned um, for buildings that have both non-market rental and market strata units amenity spaces can be challenging because there may be demand for amenities but they can be cost prohibitive for non-market operators and tenants mm -hmm. um, this person was wondering um, hearing from the panelists if they have any experience or comments on this challenge uh, I can jump in on that one um it's a it's a very interesting space this because um at catalyst we were involved in we've been involved in a number of projects where we we've acquired 
uh, what's called, some kind of called inclusionary housing. So the affordable housing component built by a market developer as part of their give to uh, in return for the rezoning for a market condo project. Uh, we acquired 31 homes in a, in a, a block um, in a project in Richmond. And it was it was a very successful project. It took a long time to put together. Um, it, um, but basically, what we ended up doing was buying a, a what's called an airspace parcel. So it's a separate legal title that that, that contains these affordable homes. So it's actually not part of the strata, right? And and it and interestingly though. You know, mayor and council were very interested in, and some staff were very interested in, in in the nonprofit, the low market rental housing, uh, being sprinkled throughout the building. So it would be rather than thirty one homes in a block, it would be thirty one strata titled units sprinkled around the building. And I somewhat facetiously said at the at the development permit hearing. I said we need that we need these homes to be in a block because if we are minority share strata owners in a three hundred unit strata, and the strata decides we want to hire a concierge, that's sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars of operating costs that we're going to have to pay our share of in operating this building. And I said, with all due respect, our tenants don't need help organizing their ballet tickets right so it kind of got a bit of a laugh but it was it was making a point that th that we have to be in control of our costs because we have a we've got a different set of objectives right and so i think that's a long answer to i think the question is that there's a way to for each of those blocks of of homes to have their own amenity spaces. And in the case of this particular project, we also we then shared a large outdoor rooftop deck area with a children's play area and a barbecue area and all the like. That was that was perfectly fine because you know the cost of maintaining and operating something like that is very limited. So I think that it's finding a balance of what space do we need, what space do we need to have control over, both from a physical perspective but a cost perspective, and then what are the spaces that we can share, uh, so that you get that kind of call it the more more connection. So that's the a, a kind of real live example of how we try to balance out those competing yeah. interests. I feel uh, I feel like this could be that that question could fill a whole other webinar just on its own, you know, because as as more and more of our communities do have uh, inclusionary housing and inclusionary zoning models, um, we're going to see a lot more of that. And people, you know, I think it'd be good to communicate some of the kind of best practice examples of, of how you can do that. Yeah. Madeline, did you want to weigh in that one or should we move to another question? I just wanted to add something quickly, you know, going back to Robert's point is like going back to that intentionality. So, um, you know, what are the different groups that are going to be housed in that building um, and kind of like what are their, you know, their, what is their framework for, for feeling well and safe in a building? Um, and you may find that depending on, on the mix, um, it may be that the solution is to have separate spaces because they have specific needs or um, you're looking at a trauma-informed design approach, um, but you may also find that, like as Robert said, there's opportunities for for mixing and sharing, and then you know opportunities to create smaller spaces where you have those smaller social group sizes where mm. a nonprofit operator can bring in their program and really build community among those residents. Very very contextual, as many things are. Brian, what do you got next? Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, how can municipalities encourage more community-centric design without adding more layers of regulation and bureaucracy? And in brackets, they added adding delays and costs. Madeline, I'm going to turn this one over to you for some thoughts about all the things we were talking about with planners in our workshops. Yeah. Well, not all um, of them, just this one specific. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated question. Um, 
because you know every municipality has layers and layers and layers of policy um and you know for a long time we our planners have been reactionary um because things move quickly and you know context is always changing they're like oh suddenly we need you know a guideline or a requirement for this and uh, we don't always have time to to update those understand where they fit in with the whole context um, so that's something that we've been challenging the municipalities that were partnering with us to look at their, you know, their policies holistically um, and understand, you know, what have been the outcomes of these policies. Um, so, you know, are these just words on a paper that are not actually leading to, to good, positive, built outcomes? Um, or are they actually, you know, positively influencing what's being built? Um, so we, we did a very thorough kind of research project with the city of North Vancouver to understand their active design guidelines. Um, and that piece of policy they've had in place since 2015, it was really um, kind of a set of non-mandatory design guidelines that had a few incentives associated with them that were aiming to encourage developers to think more holistically about their building in terms of social connection um, and kind of active living. And so, you know, I think this was the first time that we had been able to, to do a deep dive into a city's policy and understand what have been the exact implications. So we, we looked at all the buildings that had taken up a piece of the active design guidelines. We looked at like, what were the outcomes for the residents in those buildings um, and went back to it. And, you know, that's a lot of, it's a lot of work. Um, and planners don't, don't necessarily always have the, the time to do it, um, which was the thinking that, you know, we have been, trying to get municipalities working together because, you know, if we can all learn from North Vancouver's example, for, um, you know, you don't have to also test the same policy. You can, you know, test the next version um, and another municipality is going to test the next version. So I think it's like finding those efficiency points, um, setting kind of minimum standards for well-being, um, and then thinking about incentives for, for well-being elements that may go above and beyond the kind of minimum standards which again will be kind of context specific. Yeah. And just a reminder too, for, for those of you who uh, might not have caught the, the early part of my presentation, uh, the work that we've been doing with six local Metro Vancouver municipalities, um, it will actually wrap up in a toolkit that other municipalities can use and refer to. So a lot of the visuals that you saw in Madeline's presentation of the principles, you know, some of the, some of the ideas around what levers do municipalities have, um, you know, we'll, we'll all be in there and we're hoping for that to be uh, available starting hopefully end of June. So that that will come and we will continue to do sessions like this where we where we share some of those ideas. Yeah, and we are in the midst too of um, uh, of, of looking for multi-year funding to continue this model of sustained cross-sectoral dialogue and then sharing across BC Canada and beyond. Um, so hopefully we'll kind of keep, you know, digging deeper into it. And I know there was a question um, in there about uh, that this is all great for new buildings, but what do we do, you know, in existing buildings? We'd like to start working with with planners and others to 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 move eventually from design policy for new buildings to what can we do during retrofits to think about, you know, social connection, social spaces, um, uh, and what kind of, what can we do around programming? That's another really really big area that Hey Neighbor Collective works in is actually around intentional programming within existing housing. So um, maybe uh, Ryan, if you could post a few links to our practice guides around programming, that would be great at the end. Um, but uh, but before you do that, uh, what what's our next question? Yes. Um, let's pull it up here. We had also a question around um, relating to design. A couple of questions. Um, do you have any advice for nonprofit developers to navigate the additional design and construction costs that will be incurred with the new BC Building Code accessibility updates? Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say that we're, we're just kind of diving into to, to this, um, that the kind of implications of that um, on one of our projects. Um, so I can't say that I have uh, anything concrete to share as of this point. Um, obviously, the, those changes aren't official yet, um, but they are likely changing. They're going to change, you know, how we, we design units. Um, and it might be yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think I haven't done the, the work to, to speak to it. I don't know, Robert, if you want 
talk about anything from, from some of your past projects in terms of adaptable or accessible units? Yeah, um, I, I don't like to, I, first of all, I, I'm not, I haven't looked at detail at the, ex, you know, the proposed changes. I know there's been a lot of pushback um, as to what yeah. the extent of the requirements is going to be. Um, you know, the depending on the definition and depending on the details, there's there's a number of municipalities that require all all homes to be adaptable, right? So there's a way to do it, but it's a question of how how far do you go and what are the details of those accessibility requirements. I think, to be frank, in my opinion, and that to to make all homes accessible within a building makes no sense. I mean, that's not what people need when they're living in a home or a lot of people need when they're living in a home and certain people do. Therefore having a number of homes which are more accessible and then having, you know, I, I don't see any major issue with if it, depending on the details of having all homes being able to be adaptable to a certain level of accessibility, but it's all in the details. I mean, are you, do you have to have roll in showers? Do you have to, you know, do you have to have wider corridors and wider doors? If you start implementing it, that kind of change at that across the building, it's going to be a major, major cost issue. And I and I'm yeah. really not sure on how much benefit it provides to a large portion of the building. Right. Yeah, particularly, you know, we know that units are getting squeezed smaller and smaller. So um, you know, if you have um, requirements which are likely going to affect the bathroom, the circulation spaces, the bedroom, um, what's going to end up getting squeezed is the living spaces of the unit. So it, it's a yeah, it's a matter of you know testing that, and it's an exercise in like, does this lead to to better overall unit outcomes? Um, obviously, like adaptable units and, and accessible units are very much needed in our in our building. Um, but like whether 100% is the right the right target, um, I think remains probably remains a question for a lot of people, and I don't think many people have actually tested what the implications of these are on on building floor plans. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel like we have time for one more question, Ryan. Okay. One more question. <laughs> better be a good one. No pressure. <laughs> or you know what? I think we're at the point too where there's where there uh, are not so many people left that we couldn't do a hands up if somebody doesn't quite know how they want to write it out, but they've got something burning. So feel free at this point to uh, use the hands up function if you like. Ah, have we reached the end of the questions? Oh, oh no! All right, Cade, hey, got in there. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, this one's for Robert. Uh, this one's for Robert. Just wondering um, how much impact can cross subsidization of affordable units with market units deliver? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely beneficial. Uh, I mean, I would say that, you know, most of the projects that we did with Catalyst or I did with Catalyst had an element or had a, what I would call mixed income. So the, the homes were a number of homes are at different levels of rents serving people at different levels of income. And so there was de in that respect, there was definitely a cross subsidization. And, you know, if you don't have a level of cross subsidization like that, really fundamentally what it means is you need a significant grant contribution because something has to make up the gap. You're either making up that gap with more borrowing, which needs to be paid for with, you know, a higher level of rents on some homes, or you need to reduce that mortgage amount by providing grant funding. That's the basic economics of it. So I think the, and, and I think we've seen many successful projects that have a whole range of rents. I mean, from, deeply affordable to close to market. And and that, you know, that that cross subsidization model works for sure. Okay. Any other burning questions where people want to put their hands up or or anything else that's popped up or we missed in the uh, in the chat, Ryan? 
Going once. Oh, Casimir. Oh, Robert wants to make another point, and then we'll go to Casimir, and then I think we will uh, we'll wind it up. I, I have what I have one request for everybody who's still on this call. <laughs> Please, can we call these spaces that we're building mm -hmm. homes and not units? It, units is used everywhere, and it it, it I just. I, I really do think it will shift the conversation and we just simply start referring to these spaces that we're building as homes. Thank that, you for that, that reminder, pet, Robert. That's my pet peeve. Okay, next time we have you on, I'm going to make that part of uh, of my introduction to you, is that Robert reminds us these are homes, not units. Because it's so easy to get into that speak. Casimir. Yes, hi, everybody. Um, a uh, great session today. I just had a question on the co-housing front. Um, I've not myself noticed, and I might have missed it, but governments, different levels of government, don't seem particularly interested in supporting co-housing um, in terms of subsidy and um, uh, low-cost financing, all that stuff. But um, are there any examples of that? I mean, it's probably mostly political too. I don't know that it's a broad appeal area, but um, I'm interested in it and I wish that <laughs> the levels of government would also get interested in it. So I'll just leave that there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Casimir, that in, in Canada, I'm not aware of any government that's that's doing anything proactive to, to support co-housing. Um, Barcelona has a really interesting model where they actually give, uh, they, they, they started a pilot project a number of years ago with, I think, six or seven plots of city-owned land and did a competitive process for um, for groups to come together and, and kind of propose their community as the one that should that should uh, uh, kind of organize that that land. Um, and it, it was so successful that they're continuing it. They're actually buying up land out of the private market to do more of it. Um, and it's there's been enough co-housing happening now in Barcelona that there are groups coalescing to help the next one get off the ground and the next one and the next one. So um, that's a model I would love to see um, here as well. But I think because in Canada so far, co-housing is is not seen as anywhere near uh, to affordable um, because it isn't, you know, it's 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 maybe more affordable than buying a single, you know, a detached home. Uh, but it's still pretty, still pretty expensive. And, and a good chunk of that is because it's a very high risk thing for, for groups of people to do. They have to come up with all their own finance. Mostly they're not developers. Most of the projects fail because they can't actually coalesce to make all the decisions and take the risks together. Um, and then cities, frankly, make it incredibly difficult because they don't understand the model and they put so many restrictions on it that, um, yeah, I, I was just talking to a group where they thought they were each going to lose probably a hundred thousand dollars per um, per household that was participating because it wasn't going to go through. So the the collective of people were going to lose, you know, well over a million dollars um, that they had put down on the deposit of a land. Uh, so yeah, so very very difficult. But I don't know, Madeline, you've you've got experience kind of watching the co housing space. Yeah, I mean, I think. Fundamentally, it remains a very niche form of housing, um, particularly urban co-housing. And uh, Michelle pointed out all the difficulties of groups forming. Developing housing is incredibly hard and incredibly complicated, even for you know professionals who have been doing yeah. it for many, many years. Um, so yeah, I think the reason that we're not seeing you know investments from, for example, you know CMHC is because they're they're focusing on other forms of housing that are more mainstream. Um, lead to affordability outcomes, um, and you know, co-housing is very much still seen as, as this kind of very niche housing that is, you know, benefiting largely higher income people um, in our cities. Um, doesn't often include rentals. Um, so, you know, a few of the projects in in Vancouver and in North Vancouver have included a few affordable housing units, um, but it's quite difficult to to include those and make them out actually work work out. Um, so yeah, it, it remains, yeah, quite a niche. But but again, like more education on on what it is. And the reason that I use a lot of co-housing examples is because they do such a beautiful job of intentionally thinking about social connection. And, you know, how can we pull some of those ideas and principles into, you know, regular market and non-market housing? Yeah. 
I think too uh, one of the one of the areas where it's going to be really important to uh, to to start supporting models like co-housing is for um, for older adults, right? There are very very few downsizing options that are at all attractive. Um, uh, but that is one. Uh, and I know, I don't know if Sue Lance is still on the call. I know she was until a while ago, but um, certainly a lot of people who are, you know, active in in advocating for more kind of options and choices for older adults, um, you know, it's a huge one, you know, and it doesn't have to be just older adults. It's not just golden girls, but, you know, intergenerational models where, um, you know, where it is easier to, uh, develop the social connections that help people to age in place and and contribute um, in in later years, right? Like we have this terrible notion that when you're old, you just retire and you're off golfing, you know. And but there's so much that you know older adults can be giving back that's that's beneficial to them and 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 everyone they live around. So, and I count myself as one of those emerging older older adults. Um, so I want to see a lot more options like uh, like mainstream co housing out there. For sure. All right. I think we could probably keep going for another hour, but I will uh, I will be respectful of our presenter's time and uh, wrap this up. Thank you to everybody who uh, stayed on the call even longer. And thank you to uh, to Robert and Madeline for your for your time and for all the preparation and all the work that you do. Um, thank you very much. And I uh, hope that everybody has a great day. OK. Thanks, Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye bye. And, and please do make sure to take a, a, a quickly click on that uh, evaluation link and give us your thoughts. Okay. That was excellent. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you, Laura. Have a great day. Thank you. Give me some hope. <laughs> <laughs> I've been homeless for two years. Oh, my goodness, Laura. I'm so yeah. sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry. I'm, a, I'm a house sitter. I live in other people's beautiful homes, but it can't go on forever. I'm 83 years old, so... Yeah. You know what, Laura, I, I know another woman in my community who's in that same place. She does a lot of house sitting for, for other people and yeah. in between is living in her car. And oh. I mean, she's just a wonderful person and there's just so, there's so little out there. Yeah. 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 Tell, her to, tell her to join trusted house sitters. That's what I do. I always have a place to stay. Trusted house sitters. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is yeah. that an online yeah. platform? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it costs money to join. Maybe you can help her out with that. But I, there's there's twenty no five new ones a day in British Columbia. Amazing! I actually didn't know about that site, Laura. Thanks for thanks yeah. for letting, oh, letting us know about oh, that. Oh, it's essential. Yeah. I, yeah. I would be living in my car without it. Yeah, and I'm not going to let our dear government have that satisfaction. <laughs> Good I'm for you. Going to be free. <laughs> good for you uh laura can i ask you a quick question uh yes. because because we are still recording mm. um uh, and your name is uh on your profile there would you yes. prefer us to to stop the recording that we share before that comment or are you proud um, to, are you proud yeah, to tell you, that you, story no you can you can use me i mean okay. i'm i'm up for helping people get a home for god's sakes after yeah a life of service. Now you have to ask for a home yeah. to live in. I, yeah. Give me a break. Yeah. 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 Okay. Absolutely, Laura. Give me a fucking break. Yes, you got it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Ridiculous. <laughs> there is no way on God's free earth that the creator or life or the universe or the cosmos planned it this way. There's no way. This has got to, this is human invention and it's got to stop. Well, Laura, that is officially what they call a mic drop. Okay. <laughs> okay. <I'm done. laughs> Bye. Thanks, Laura. We, we wish you well, Laura. Thank you, dear. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Perfect. Let's end that recording there, Ryan. Holy shit. Wow. What a